Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 46 with Mark Reese. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say a big welcome to Bodo Glimt. Uh, it's a pro club out in Norway. We are now uh, supporting the academy there with the club partnership. Had a call from the academy manager this week, obviously with everything going on with the coronavirus. Very keen to get his players on board. Uh, so really proud to be before, um, supporting this club. We were able to do it within 24 hours, get those, those players on board with uh, some quality, world-class uh, remote learning that the players can do from home. Obviously, you know, this is, uh, you know, a bit of a strange time for everyone, but uh, my personal football coach is working hard with all our partners, uh, clubs, federations, pro clubs, federations, grassroots clubs all around the world to, to support them in this difficult time to basically look, give their players some something to do when they're at home and they're not allowed to come to training. Uh, we're also offering a 50% discount on the club partnership at the moment. So if you're interested, if you're a grassroots club, interested how we can support you and uh, giving your players some quality stuff to do while they're at home and you can also log in and check the usage uh, just give me a dm and we can get that sorted uh, within 24 hours for use but uh, also we've just updated the app and players can now upload their own videos and um, add them to a team library which will be specific to your club so this is a really good way of actually you know getting social interaction especially now the players will be at home a way to keep them within the club and also players can uh, like each other's videos and also coaches and obviously parents can also um, log on there as well so a nice way to try and get some peer review but also then coaches can see still see what's going on so having that uh, still having that club interaction but like I say drop me an email saw at mypersonalfootballcoach.com and we can get you guys up and running within 24 hours now to the show um, really happy and proud that we've got Mark Reese on the show this this week uh, Mark is really one of uh, one of the most experienced coaches around there he's worked for many many years uh, at Man City at Blackburn at Crewe these huge uh, t- talent development hotbeds uh, been an individual technical coach like myself so I was really eager to get him on there and and pick his brains uh, obviously someone who has a similar sort of um, uh, trade as myself working individually with players uh, done it at the very highest level so really there's uh, this guy is, he's one of the best guys around in football he's got a lot of knowledge uh, got a lot of experience he knows it he knows the game he's been there and done that he's got the t-shirt so uh, I'm really sure you're going to enjoy this show it's a fantastic one and uh, he's got so much knowledge to share and, and I think that's what the difference is you know when you when you speak to you know, world-class practitioners like Mark himself, who who's worked at the highest level of the game and learned off some of the best other coaches and worked with so many top players. And also, interestingly enough, worked in the in the male game, worked with the female game as well. So worked in the academy system at City. Also worked with the female players at Man City. So talk a lot about the difference in in the approach uh, between those two two different areas. But uh, yeah, I'm sure you're going to see this one. I just want to say as well, if you do enjoy the show, please do leave a review. Um, it really does help. I really would appreciate it. Uh, and listen, look, been a bit, a bit of a hiatus recently. Had a few things going on, but I'm back in the game now. Uh, got to record in lots of podcasts. Got lots of new interesting things happening with the app as well, which I'm going to tell you about. And uh, yeah, uh, um, we're we're living in dodgy times here, but you know what? Uh, uh, it's just about we all we can do is what we can do. And uh, I'm looking forward to trying to bring you uh, lots more quality content in 2020. Mark Reese, Hello. welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me on, mate. I hope you are. Yeah, very well. Good to have you on the show, mate. Could you just give us a brief outline of your playing and coaching journey up to this point, please? So, um, as a young boy, I signed at um, Crow Alexander. Um, I was there for like nine, ten years. Um, you know, working with some fantastic coaches, people like Steve Holland, Dario Grady, Neil Critchley, James Collins, um, Terry Matt Phillips, who've, who've all gone on and become managers or done iconic things in the game and then um, I, I went and played at Stockport after crew uh, around when I was 19 um, then flicked around a few other football clubs but kind of fell out of love with the game couldn't keep fit but um, in the meantime when I was younger I moved to crew um, when I was 15 so I spent a lot of time up there um, I actually started coaching 
um, for the reason that I was going back to the training ground and, and you know, I was probably doing too much. So I kind of got pushed on to, to start working with some of the younger kids. Anyway, ended up really, really enjoying it. Uh, really, really enjoyed being around it. Really enjoyed thinking about the game, you know, from being on the side of the pitch. And um, that was the start of my coaching career, really. And from there, because I took that more as a priority as playing. Um, and even when I left career, I continued to coach mm-hmm. there. Um, then I moved on to um, Blackburn Rovers. Uh, when they were in the Premier League um, and I spent three years there so initially I went in as the um, head of foundation so which was involved in recruitment players um, six, sevens, eights retaining players nine, tens and eleven but then also you know uh, producing a coaching programme when the E-Triple P came out um, then once um, I was at Blackburn I then got um, head on by Man City so I went over to Man City um when Mancini was the manager, David Platt, Tilio Lombardo, and became the technical coach um, for boys 13 to 21, um, before it was an EDS or before it was under 23. And what I used to do there was work individually with certain players, um, probably worked a lot more with players who we thought um, had a real good opportunity of kicking on and having a career in our first team at the time. Um, you know some of the best talent in the country you know what we've had within that system you know it's great to see the likes of Phil you know the Jaden Sancho's Lucas Nemechas the Brahim Diaz's um, and many other players who've had you know um, careers in the game and currently are in the game um, and then my, my, my last I was there for just under eight years and then my last 16 months I um, switched over with Nick Cushion to um, work with the Man City women's first team, so really, really privileged, you know, to to uh, learn about the women's game in such a short time, but then also to work with some fantastic people and some some of the best women footballers in the world, um, you know, and, and some of some of some of the best people I've ever worked with within the game as well, if I'm being honest. Um, likes of Steph Orton, Tony Duggan, you know, Jill Scott, Lucy Bronze, Carly Lloyd. Um, you know, Carly Lloyd's a Ballon d'Or winner, World Cup winner, um, and and also you know seeing seeing the game from a different angle, you know, and, and being able to compare the women's game to to the men's game, the mentality, the attitudes, you know. Um, so yeah, it's been a really good journey. I've also worked with um, a lot of players individually outside of um, the clubs I was at, um, as I used to have a um, private coaching business, which provided like consultancy work for players who are at clubs um, or players who were playing grassroots who, who shown talent and potential and just needed a little bit of guidance and I've been quite lucky that some of them you know boys and girls have gone on and kicked on and you know they're playing professionally now um, which is fantastic because when I started with them we were on parks we were bloody being moved around we were in car parks we were on playgrounds coaching so um my coaching journey's not just been working within professional clubs, you know. I've had the hardship of working in schools, you know, learning the trade, you know, been in nurseries. Um and, and, and that's probably got me to a point where, you know, I've refined my skill set and obviously had the opportunity to practice and develop through communicating to all different types of people and different levels and different abilities. Um Fantastic. So, so then, yeah, so just let's just uh, rewind then go back to that first coaching job at crew. Alexander, tell us about that. In terms of uh, what was that like? What were those first few sessions like, and what did you, what experiences did you draw on in terms of how you dealt with the kids? What were your challenges? What was session design like? So, so when I was at Crew, um, obviously, you know, one of one of the best, and, and regardless of what's gone on, you know, one of the best and prolific coaches the country's ever had, Dario. You know, kept the game simple. Um, and, and as a player, when you've been in that system, um, I think it's easy to take on, you know, the principles, the philosophy of what the club is, and, and to pass that on to players. Um, but then also the the bit which which I learned was was how you pass that information across the players and how you communicate it, and and really refining, you know, when you talk, when you don't talk, you know. I think when you're young and naive and you're full of confidence, you know, you probably talk too much and um, one thing with me was, was you know, we always listen, we always listen to Dario at the time, 
you know, there were some other fantastic coaches there, but but you know, he knew how to create players. And, and one thing when we were there, one thing what I will say is it's probably like a little bit of a like a YTS for me, even though I was getting paid to coach. Was he wasn't just a coach; he was a kit man. He was the head of recruitment for the team. He was logistics, you were operations, all these different roles were in football clubs now. And you were doing everything. You know, you were doing everything. You were getting the kit out, you were putting the kit back, putting the kit in the washing machine, you were pumping the balls up. Um but but that love of the game and the the way crew was as a club, it wasn't a numbers game. It was more around finding, you know, not just players who were good at under six, seven, eight, but finding players who long term have so much potential and, and were were the best learners. Um, technically, you know, one thing at crew, which was massive, was was the ability to strike the ball with two feet. You know, the boards around the training ground were probably the most essential bit of equipment um, than goals and poles and mannequins and whatever else is out there now. Um, so, I mean, just so, the so, 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 to interrupt, mate. So, a lot, a lot of people won't I, maybe maybe appreciate the amazing track record crew Alexander had as a as a, as a player development centre. Down in the lower leagues there, but so give us an idea. You talked about the repetition of the ball ball striking. What else? Yeah, yeah. What are the secrets behind the the player development success uh, Dario Gradi had at Crew? I think I think the thing is it's simple. It's 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 you know the model had to work. So the, you, you know some football clubs, you know what I've been at, and other football clubs, you know you you have to you've got uh, a luxury of you you can get players, but there's no guarantee that the players will go through, and you don't have to push them through because of first team recruitment but in regards to, to crew you know the players which you sign you had to work with now that doesn't mean they're always the quickest that doesn't always mean they were most intelligent but but whatever skill sets they had you had to really maximize that and and, and also try and you know um, develop and generate you know the weaknesses um, but working you know collectively you know, one thing I will say is that crew, you know, there are certain aspects of the game and certain technical actions or tactically, you know, certain stuff what we did, which was aligned all the way through from under nines to the first team. And, and you know, in the time I was there, there was numerous times where they, they, they played full academy squads in the first team. Um, and, and if Dario said a boy at 12, 13 was going to go and play in the first team, he also had the power to do it, but he knew that that kid had that ability through years of being on the pitch and experience of working with young players, um, which, you know, if he said it, you know it was happening, you know, whereas other people go, yeah, you're playing the first team, but they never have the power or, you know, managers might change, you know. But, but I mean, he was so, obviously... so if you see that as a 12 and 13 year old, what's, what's he seeing in a 12 and 13 year old which is convincing he's going to play the first team? I, I think there's there's loads of things. You know, you, you look at the game, you look at players. So mentality, um, the ability to learn, the willingness to learn. Um, you know, um, being consistent. You know, with and without the ball, as in being a hard worker. And, and you know, when you're in possession and out of possession, um, you, you know, the drive to go and win the ball back, bravery on the ball, not just bravery as in put your body on the line to, to you know go and win a ball back but bravery is in to be creative you know in maybe areas of the pitch where other people wouldn't um, and then also just just you know the constant drive day to day daily when they cross the white line to 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 have that end goal if they wanted to play in the first team now if they had that and they showed that you know the coaches would you'd have the team sessions but players would come in and we'd work with them individually before training after training um so it wasn't like that's your session and you go, you know, with, with, with most of the players and even players who, you know, in every group, I think at different ages, certain boys, girls um, show, you know, high potential or low potential. Um, and I think one of the key things is, is when we was at crew was um, it was really important that everyone got treated the same and everyone got given an opportunity to develop. Um, so it wasn't, oh, this boy's the best kid at under 10. We need to work with him now. And then all of a sudden it changed at under 12. You know, every kid who was there at that point, um, we, we gave them as much time and attention and, you know, effort to develop them. And certain kids, obviously, you know, when they're in the club, they work hard. But certain kids, when they go home, they don't do anything. You know, it all goes out the window. Whereas the ones who really want it, they live for it, they breathe it. So when they go home, they're practicing, you know, they're getting early nights, they're sleeping, they're eating right. 
um, they're studying the game. You know, they're not going to the game as a football fan. They're going to the game and looking at players in their positions. Um, so that was probably one of the biggest things at Crew was was generating that mindset, generating you know, is do players have them capabilities? Um, and obviously, you know, we were very lucky because at the time Steve Holland was in the first team, Dario was in the first team. But they were taking the under sevens, the under eights, the under tens, the under fourteens, the under eighteen. So, you know, what was actually going on in the first team was going on in the academy without a doubt. Um, so yeah, you know, it was, it was a great time and it was and great what, to work what, with some really good players. Then, what do you think are, are the the main takeaways there as a coach you took from that initial experience working on you're talking about Steve Holland, Dario Grady, you know, some of the giants of English football coaching wise. What are the main takeaways there were talked to you in your, your the future coaching journey? Uh, I think the key things for me was was the value of, of teaching players to 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 be two footed and to be able to receive the ball, deal with the ball the pressure. Um, one thing was screening the ball, so protecting the ball you know, manipulating the ball to try and, you know, move away from players in tight situations. Um, they, they they were the key things, really, you know. Um, and then also just, just you know, which is a given, is, is just encouraging players to work hard every day, work hard, you know. Crew wasn't the most flash training ground in the world, but they had goals, they had an indoor, they had an outdoor pitch. And, you know, one thing what I've learned is over the years is, you know, training grounds are a shell. It's the work what goes on the pitch, and and the work what went on the pitch was planned. It was detailed. You know, every player uh, was was thought through thoroughly in regards where they're at and potentially where they could be and how we're going to get them to fill their uh, potential. But going back to what I'm saying, is the key thing for me is is you know players being able to strike the ball two footed, um, and 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 receive the ball two footed and have that balance. You know. So I mean, uh, you're talking there really. About technical base right for yeah players. yeah 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 definitely mate definitely and, and and it's i think there's a massive debate in regards you know certain people um certain people argue well no let's just get players one footed but you'll have an unbelievable right foot or an unbelievable left foot um whereas you know i i probably come to the conclusion of you know if you can use two feet, you can play on any part of the pitch you know you're always going to get a game and, and yeah, i can't i can't understand that that, that logic either when people talk about that one foot and also in the current environment where it's you know game based and things like that is that how much quality weak footwork are players getting at training sessions do you know what I mean are we really you know players coming in at 8 years old and they're getting through the foundation phase at 11 or 12 for me there's no excuse why they should be able to be proficient by feet what do you think about that Sorry, say that again. So you I said, I, I said, I said, you know, we have players that come in the foundation phase at eight years old, nine, and yeah, you know, leave yeah. at twelve. You know, for me, there's no excuse why players shouldn't be two footed, proficient on both feet on their weak foot at least. Yeah, definitely. That, I, I think you know you're always gonna have one foot stronger than the other, but but it's 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 you know it's like uh, a big thing is dexterity. So you know if you if you my little boy's five you know he, he plays with a phone he can type with his right hand he can type with his left hand he can type without even bloody looking you know whereas a lot of kids when it comes to the ball you know they can walk around with the ball or the feet all day on one foot but when they go on the other foot you know it's um, it's that old analogy of you know with, with the kids what I used to say was you know what do you want to be a, when you play football what do you want to be a rhino or a giraffe and they all used to go a rhino and I say no you don't because you're a rhino you're just going to smash into someone if you're a giraffe you can see the whole picture but to be a giraffe you need to be able to manage the ball or you're always going to be a rhino so so you know it's i think it's really important that the 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 balance and the repetition of work all different types of technical actions you know not just passing receiving but shooting um, finishing uh, crossing the ball you know um being creative with the passing not just teaching them to pass the ball with a weak foot but then teaching them to you know be creative with the passing reverse the passing with the right and the left playing with the outside of the feet because then Plays also then have a psychological and a tactical advantage of being unpredictable, you know. Whereas defenders now, how athletic they are in the Premier League and in the top leagues, if someone's just one-sided, you know, a lot of them players just, you know, they don't affect the game, you know. Whereas I think you've, you, you know, you've always got something else what you can offer when you've got two feet. Um, but I'm agreeing with you, you know. I think it's really important to value it and. and no matter where we work and who we work with, I push it. Um, and 
you know, it's something which players I think should really, really be working on daily. Um, you know, 100%. to be the best player they could be. So then, so let's let's talk about then your next uh, your move. You move um, to Blackburn. Tell us about that. People, well, maybe some people won't even remember. At Blackburn used to be one of the powerhouses in English football. What was it like then as you you went into that club? Yeah, it was, well, it, so so when I went to Blackburn, um, it, I will say this: there was some of the the most hardest working. Um, Probably some of the, the the best the best coaches, recruiters, um, scouts, um, the team of people who we were all together um, for a period before things changed with the owners and stuff. Um, but it was a fantastic club. Um, I, you know, I had some great memories there. You know, worked with some great players there, um, and and you know, the, it was a different philosophy. It was a different model it was a different methodology in the way they played um, so, so let's just tell, to be explicit then tell us what was different about that model the philosophy and the it, play style I, I, there was probably more specific um, requirements for players um, because you you use that club where there was more finance there was a bigger budget at the start um, which allowed you then to recruit you know players internationally as well as nationally and locally um, and the technical program was was probably a little bit more uh, formal in regards, you know, things were on paper more. It wasn't just around the, you know, the philosophy of the club and and you know what the first team what it, it was around. Because when I went there, the Triple P kicked in, so the elite player performance plan then had requirements in regards to technical program, and so it, it, you know I think it was great. Uh, the time was there because the people like David Lowe, who's the head of coaching at the time, he's the assistant manager there now, you know, was all about the players. You know, the people who were there were all about the players, um, all about developing the players. You know, they'd be on the grass early in the morning, they'd be on the grass after sessions, they'd be on the grass in the afternoon. And for me, that's where, you know, the, that, that's what the game's about, even with kids. It's around practice, it's around learning. You know, you can be on the grass and not run around and talk to a player around the technical action or tactical action and, and I think when I was at Blackburn that was probably like another factor in my coaching career um, which something I really really value now you know something which I still do with players now was was you know just a different way of, of getting the end the end goal of what you want you know because as you know when you learn it's a way it's not the way uh, and we're all different and the players are different and you know I think um Working with some of the people at the time at the club, um, it, it it was nice to be challenging for probably players um, who were I'm not saying higher end, but at younger years at eight and nine. As you know yourself, the clubs you've been at, um, you, you know if you're a crew, you're probably going to get a certain type of player. You might get one or two or maybe three top top players, but your Man United, your Liverpool's, your Blackburns, your Everton's will probably get more of the top top you know potential players um, at the start um, because of you know resources they have um, so being at Blackburn it was nice to be able to work with probably bigger groups of not more talented players but but probably early more signs of early potential at early ages if that makes sense um, but so, yeah, so, so, fantastic so, club, great and, time there, mate. And so, what was the the playing style? What how was it different? To... I think I think the playing style at Blackburn was more around um, players being brave on the ball. But but then obviously the, the games program was different at Blackburn because with the Triple P it became categorised the games. So you, you know we when we was at Crew we used to play Liverpool United Blackburn we used to beat them, but. You know, no one, no one remembers an under nine result. You know, um, it, it was more around the style of play at Crew was, you know, a set type of thing, and the players knew the way they had to play. Whereas at Blackburn, you know, I think it allowed the players to have the structure of when you're when you're in possession and certain parts of the pitch, you play a certain way. But then, like when you're around the final thirds or on the sides of the pitch, you know, you was allowing that creativity with the players and, you know, letting players really express themselves. Um, so it, yeah, it's it's I can't really nail it as in regards to the differentiation from the two clubs, but I think the program was you know 
um, probably a little bit more detailed um, because of what was going on with the Premier League and the clubs at the time. And for me as a coach, I think it certainly improved me as a coach because you had to think in more detail yourself. You know, and when as the game evolves, you've got to evolve. And what about, so you're a foundation phase lead there. What was that like um, in terms of, from a professional point of view, having to manage other coaches and um, that sort of thing? How did that... Happen? Yeah, I, I, think, I think because I, you know, um, outside of football, I had... A business as well. I was, I was used to managing people and maybe doing a bit of delegating and stuff. But it's different in a business industry to a football industry because you're not judged on making um, finances and result and, and, and money. You're based on developing players. And, and you know, I don't think there's um, one way of developing a player. But one thing, what's really important is, I think when we were there and there's uh, another lad, you know, who, who's fantastic as well, called Michael Cribbley, who's at Everton now. Um, who did a lot of recruitment side, you know, it was getting people to, you know, be approachable. It was getting people to, you know, uh, understand that, you know, we're not a football club where we're the coaches and you're the parents. You know, it was like one big family. Um, and, and we were just trying to make sure that, you know, every player, you know, at them ages, you know, really enjoyed themselves. Every player and parent knew, you know, the plan for them individually and how we were going to develop them. Um, and it's like anything, really, you know, when you start something, there's certain people who've got the capability of, you know, buying into what you do. And there's certain people who, um, unfortunately, probably don't buy into what you're doing or they don't believe in it or that they're very set in the ways. And, and there's other people who, you know, you go out and you recruit and, you know, it's like the missing piece in the jigsaw, you know. So I think in the two, the two years at one point when, you know, we were financially backed and you know we we had everything what we needed in regard to resources we were challenging a lot of the bigger clubs you know at the younger years not in results but you know level of players individually levels of teams collectively um, and also having the ability to mix the style of play when we were there um, so yeah it was it was a great experience and, so, and know, tell we, us we, about just like the general philosophy then your, your lead your, your foundation lead what was the philosophy of the, you know, the foundation phase of Blackburn at the time? Where they come from yourself, or was it come from the, the yeah, management? Yeah, well, we were quite lucky because because the, the the guy who was the academy manager at the time, Phil Cannon, was was unbelievable with us, and um, he he had a lot of trust in us. You know, he had a lot of belief in us. He backed us if we if we needed something. So, in regards, you know, myself, you know, I'm very very big on. I want players to be comfortable on the ball. I want players to be creative on the ball. Um, I want players to be able to, you know, manipulate the ball, you know, in any situation, as well as being aware when they had the ball. Now, certain people didn't believe in that. They wanted players to just pass and receive the ball, which is, you know, a massive technical action which players need to have. But when when they're so young, you know, they need to be express themselves. And you know, someone might play midfield when they're under nine, but they, you know, they could play anywhere when they're under sixteen. Now, you don't want to restrict any of them players from having a career in the game um, so you know for myself the philosophy was very much around you know 9s, 10s, 11s you know having a real good understanding of 77 football uh, or 99 football um, linking the 77 to the 99 in regards you know uh, the tactical side of the game but then also making sure that we give all the players the correct and the right technical actions to be successful in the game um, and, and giving them not just the technical actions but the tactical understanding of when to use that technical action which was you know which a lot of people wasn't doing at the time um, so yeah it was good it was a real good place and you know a big part of my coaching journey and, and so, um, so tell us then about then you progressed to the technical coach of the under 18s I had that come about, and what was what was that? What did that look like day to day? So, for you? so, 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 what happened then was I was still I was still in my role with the foundation, but I um, the guy who was the manager at the time, Tony Matt Phillips, who recently was the manager of Blackpool as well, and Tony Grant, who used to play for Everton, and um, they, 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 obviously Terry used to be my coach as a kid at Crew, um, so in regards to the concepts of crew and the things which crew buy into as in regards to what they want players to do. Terry believed in that and he took them over to Blackburn and 
you know, the stuff what he believed in. And so I think when you've got more people working off the same hymn sheet, you know, you become more consistent as a team, you become more consistent as a club. Um, and, and, and it was very much around uh, making sure that the players, uh, when it was, say, the technical coach, it was more around developing players individually, but then making sure collectively, you know, every player was getting the opportunity to at least get... X amount of time working on certain technical actions, which were really important to take them into the games, whether it was like final third actions, whether it was midfield actions. Um, so, you know, and Terry kind of just trusted me and believed in me to go, All right, poof, there's your time period. Who do you want to work with? Um, you know, can we work on this, this and this? And, you know, sometimes we would design a session between us. Then three quarters of the time I'd design the session working on looking at the games, looking at certain players. Or sometimes what I do is is specifically go, look, I just want to work with these players today because I think they they really need of of topping up in certain areas and, and we need to really push certain actions with them so they become more beneficial when they play. Um so it was a really good relationship, you know. It was really valued the work as well, because certain coaches, you know, all over the world um, have different beliefs and stand by different stuff as in what they think is um, really beneficial for players um, so yeah it was good mate it was good it was good you know and uh, the lads the lads really enjoyed it as well which was nice and so tell us then about then you get the call to, uh, to, to move across to Manchester City uh, tell us how that came about and obviously you know the juggernaut of the, well, the new juggernaut of English football what was that like moving across um, Man, Man City was so um, it was hard it was hard for me because cause, um, Blackburn was a fantastic club there were some fantastic people there was a little bit of upset in regards to change of owners um, but Man City at the time were, weren't in the new training ground the new training ground was actually a drawing um, and when I made that decision to, to, to switch over when there was a position available and you know, certain people thought, you know, um, I would fit the role really well. You know, obviously I had to think a lot about various different stuff as in professionally where I was at Blackburn uh, and, and, you know, what would happen if I switched over. Um, and, you know, one thing what I would say is I've never regretted the time I was there. Never regret the time I was there at Man City. And it was, um, it was unbelievable to see a club evolve, you know, with backing. Um, and evolve in regards so every single area. So, so when you first moved there, who was the owner at City? It was shit. Yes, the Shape Man so, was the owner. So the Shape Man had the club. They yeah, was, yeah, so, yeah. so then, um, who? How did how did that job come about? Who was the academy manager? Who contacted you? Um, so the academy manager at the time was 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 Mark Allen, um, who you know was was um, for me you know very 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 intelligent man who um, had a fantastic way with people, you know, never looked at, you know, if there was issues, uh, never looked at making a problem even bigger. It was always around resolving issues. And, you know, when I was in doubt of whether I was going to come or go, you know, he played a massive part of me coming over uh, with, with other people, which I can't really name. Um, but what I will say is, you know, once... Um, I had the offer, you know, it was a no-brainer to go across and, and you know, it's seven and a half years of, you know, developing myself unbelievably, if I'm being honest, as well as having a career and a job. Um, I was fortunate to work with some fantastic people in all different backgrounds and departments. And tell us a little bit about then, what were your first impressions at Manchester City as you go in there? What was the difference, um, the contrast, and the, the similarities between being the Blackburn and Crew between being there? It, it, it was, it was a, uh, there was a lot more resource. There was a lot more um, specific professionals in different areas. Um, for example, you know, a physio at Crew would probably also do the gym work. Uh, whereas you had sports scientists, nutritionists, dietitians, uh, you had analysis, um, an analyst, sorry, from from the foundation phase, the youth development phase, the professional phase, um, and and it it was probably every bracket of age group 
was supported a lot more heavily, not just from a finance point of view, but professionally, the people who were there, um, who were doing certain roles at other clubs might be students, whereas they were people who'd been in the game a long time. Um, so I'm not saying level of individual, but what I will say is, you know, in certain aspects, I will say that because of the experience of the people in the building. Um, so, yeah. About the philosophy at Man City, what was uh, what was that like? Um, so, so the, the the well, when I was there, so Scott Sellers was the technical director, uh, head of coaching at the time. And Scott was unbelievable, um, still is unbelievable as a coach and as a person. He's 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 probably you know I will say this, he's one of the people who is there for the players, um, and and you know wants to help develop people as coaches. You know, and he wants to develop players to fulfil their potential. And, and he's probably someone who, who who would never give up on players who, who other people would probably give up. And you know, certain football clubs could go and buy other players. Uh, so it's um, it, it it was it evolved it evolved really because obviously with cheeky being there and you know. Uh, there's technical meetings week in week out in regards you know the way they play in possession out of possession you know the detail of breaking the game down you know building up in certain areas of the pitch you know how you regain the ball in certain areas of the pitch you know concepts of when you receive the ball you know what concepts are really valued um, and I think as time went on uh, like Rodolfo Burrell now is the assistant manager with Pat who was the technical director at the time you know he really evolved the programme um, it became a lot more specific. Um, it became a lot more detailed in regards um, variety of of technical actions, which every kid must get an opportunity to to practice. Um, and it became more specific in regards, you know, what was the biggest actions which the you know players for Man City what they needed, and the the, the program balanced itself out for what was needed and what we thought was the most valued technical actions in the game. Um, and then there was a completely separate programme in regards to tactical stuff. You know, the level of detail was was unbelievable. Um, so give, us some, really... give some examples and tell what would a typical under nine session look like then at that time? It, it, I've, I've got to be careful what I do say. But, um, it, you know, big focus around... Um, obviously, from a ball mastery point of view, all the players being... Uh, comfortable on the ball, being able to manipulate the ball, uh, taking every you know everything grew the sessions. So you go from working on a technique or a skill or a combination of skills, and then to going into half pressure practices to full pressure practices where they can practice it one v one. And then obviously the technical program was the technical program, you know, which I can't discuss. Uh, but it 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 then you know those the players worked on. We worked on worked on various stuff, and being honest, but I think the biggest thing was around players being comfortable on the ball, but then tactically having a real good understanding of what they do with the ball, whether they've got it or the teammates have got it, and where they need to be, and how they regain the ball individually and collectively as a team was a real big, a real big uh, area we, we focused on. Looking at it from the outside, I mean, for me, my time at especially at Chelsea, Plan City, was. The foundation base very good at moving the ball. So whether you've mentioned um, was it Rodolfo? Who's Rodolfo Brau, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So obviously his influence from Barcelona. Do you know what I mean? So whether that is um, they using that very like you know possession based system, if you like. Whereas you know you can see Man City, they move the ball. They're very good as a team, individually good as well. But you can tell us even at the under nines that they were very, you know, astute at possession football and how to move the ball, keep it as a unit. I, th- I think one of the key things which, which you know, people need to realise, it's not just around possession. It, you know, you, you can be the best on the ball, but you can be in the worst position. So if your position's not right, there's no point being the best in possession. And, and so positioning was a real key thing. And, and it's like... Um, the players always being on the front foot, ready to attack, ready to defend, ready to make the pitch big, ready to make the pitch small, um, and and you know it's it's it, it was a fantastic program. It was unbelievable to work with some of the players and to see where some of them players are, what I've worked with, you know, very closely, and some of the relationships what I've still got with, you know, 
players, friends, family. Um, and, you know, as you say there, you know, the investment from the owners have created something unique. Um, and there's some fantastic coaches, some fantastic people at a football club. And, what, is, what, you know, then, what's, what, what, the, what is your main takeaways then, you know, as a coach going into that environment? What was your main thing? I think, I think one of the biggest things for me was, was when I went to Man City, I made a choice. So I made a choice in, you know, uh, being at Blackburn, I was flexible that I could still um, dip my toe into to managing my business. So, you know, I, I probably took a financial loss at the start. But the investment into my career and the experience and my knowledge of the game was the best decision I've ever made in my life. The people I know in the game, the places I can go, the players I've worked with, um, you know, some of the kids I've seen, some of the talent I've seen, some of the people I know all over the world, you know, who are working with some of the best talent, you know, some of the people I've got to watch. Um, it's all through that time when I was there. Um, there's one thing I will say is I think the club back people well and give people opportunities professionally to develop. Um, and I think one thing for me was being at a football club is, you know, I will say this, there was people in different areas who were miles more experienced than me, but also in my area of expertise. You know, I know that I helped certain people whilst I was there. Um, so it's a real good learning environment for the players. It's a real good learning environment for the staff. Um and, you know, one thing what I will say is, you know, going there for that time period I did, in whatever role I was in, um, I was just investing in my knowledge, investing in, you know, into my coaching ability. Um, and, and one thing was, was you know, what made it apparent is you've always got to be learning. You know, when I always say to the kids, you've got to be the best learner, but there's no point being the best learner with the players if you don't, you know, you've got the best learner as a coach because you're not going to keep evolving. Um and that was something that was really pushed. I always made this um, talk about when I first joined Chelsea and that the difference between maybe Spurs and Chelsea was maybe the mentality and the, the drive. Chelsea wanted to be the best academy in the country in the world. And it's funny because we used to see the Man City boys a lot on tournaments and stuff like that. And I got that same impression from those guys. They definitely had the same sort of mindset in terms of wanting to be the best academy in the north, in the country, in the world, if you like. And they were going about it like that. Do you think that? Yeah, did you notice yeah, that sort of that, so, that sort so of attitude mindset? You, 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 you have to look at you know you look at um, forget results, but but you look at competitions abroad. You look at national events. You look at futsal. You look at uh, youth Cups, you look at, you know, um, and you look at the mentality of the players, I think are very similar, both football clubs. Um, and it's always, it was, you know, I will say for a certain time period, Chelsea always edged it with the older ages and I thought we edged it with the younger ages in regards when there was competition and you wanted to see people compete. doesn't mean because they've won, they've got the best players, but they were the games which we, you know, we, we always wanted. They were the games which you actually got to see your players for who they were. Um, because you'll know yourself your time at Chelsea you know you will play over certain football clubs who don't have the recruitment resources who don't have the coaching resources and um, you, you know the, the, some of the scores which come back they're, they're not healthy they don't reflect any learning they don't reflect players developing um, they, they reflect that some of the players have had fun and they scored loads of goals but you know there's certain games which you know I think sometimes from a selfish point of view, some of our players didn't get challenged. Um, whereas when you know we went to head to head, to head, to head three self, or whether that was like international tournaments, or you know you always had a good game. And, and, and also, I will say this as a, as a coach, it, it's nice to take a team and you, you've got someone on the sideline who probably thinks very similar to the way you think and the level of detail. And so um, for everyone, it's that that's what you wanted. You know, that's what you wanted, and that's why. You know, we would travel down five, six hours to go and play Chelsea for 90 minutes or 60 minutes and drive back down the motorway again because then games were invaluable. Uh, and like you say, mentality, you know, willingness to, to win, willingness to learn, willingness to be brave on the ball. You know, some of our players and Chelsea's players at that time, uh, oh, some unbelievable talent, unbelievable talent. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? You look at it. Like you look at Chelsea in the South, Man City in the North, and obviously 
Chelsea, you know, developing that model, trying to dominate recruitment in the local area or even nationally. Man City come on the scene and try and, you know, replicate that or aspire to challenge them. And obviously now are, you know, two very two to two now big juggernauts of academy football. Not that they're saying other academies aren't good, but in terms of investment and and approach, they they dwarf everybody, you know. And do you think, you know, that's it's interesting to look at those two and then, you know, other academies, will they follow suit and, and invest the same amount of money that these uh, academies... I, I, th- I think it's what's relevant for that club, you know. Um, you know, what I will say is I don't think, because of how much money you put into a football club, um, shows how good you are as an academy is in regards developing players because crew did it on a, a shoestring budget, you know, um, and develop players and have developed players who stayed in the game a lot longer than some other football clubs who've invested millions of pounds into the game. Um, so it's um, so it's um, I think I think you know you know you maybe got to be careful you know what you say there because there is no, no, I do listen, think I'm, I'm, I'm I think not, I think there's yeah I'm not, I'm yeah. not saying that other academies aren't good I'm just saying in terms of yeah I'm not saying money equals academy but what I'm saying is that there's no okay. denying that yeah, yeah. these two clubs have invested more money probably than any yeah, other academies I, clubs yeah. in, to, in, in, I, I in, think... in the in the aspiration of dominating getting the best young talent in and and, and, and try and develop that whether that's right or wrong or who has yeah. the best on the center but they I don't think anyone could deny the fact that these two are maybe you know trying, yeah trying to trying to dominate their, their areas I, I, I think it's also it's not just trying to dominate it's um, it's 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 getting ahead, it's it's being um, you know proactive and, and developing something which a program, um, an academy, you know, um, which does attract the best players or the best potential players because it's an academy. The best potential is the key word. It's not the best players, but the best potential players. Um, and then also, I think what it does as well is it's it's you know the money what's being invested is to make sure that clubs are always ahead, you know they've always got that extra resource. You know it's like um, you know buying a box of chocolates. You know there might be four different types in one box and twelve different types in another. You know you got more variety. You got more variety in your players. You got more variety in every aspect, uh, psychologically, physically, mentally, tactically. You know what you can offer on the pitch. Um, so. It's not that them clubs are spoiled and they can have to pick at a bunch, you know, but what happens is, you know, they do have the resources to probably um, help players a lot easily fulfil their potential than maybe some other clubs at times because they have to do certain roles, um, which, which, you know, a football club like Man City, one person would have a specific role, whereas another club, it could be a League One club, a League Two club, it could be anywhere, a club abroad. You know, certain people might be employed full time, but they've actually got three different roles. So when it comes to quality of work, you know, people could be a little bit stretched. Um, but, but you know, certain people do get the job done. You know, so I take my hat off to some other clubs, you know, some of the smaller clubs, you know, some of the staff graft, graft their absolute tripod to, to give these players the best opportunity to play. Um, but I do think the finances behind it play a massive part. Um, and I do think investment plays a massive part because it gives opportunity. It gives, it can enhance programmes. Um, you know, you look at Chelsea, you look at City, you look at Arsenal, you look at Man United, you know, with the finance and the backing they have, they can afford to take the boys all over the world to play against some of the best opposition or even bring the best opposition to their training grounds. You know, so it's unique what you can offer with that finance. And so tell us a little about then your, you know, the how did your week look then as a head of technical development for twelve to 20, individual development coaches twelve to twenty threes, and what, were you, what was your day? What was your, your general week like? Um, so so when I was in that role, um, it was very much around. So so I dipped in and so so I, I as well as coaching, I um, also worked with you know I had an opportunity to work with quite a few senior players, first team players when they were coming back late stage from rehab. Um, and, and the the club wanted um, technical programs developed for them, sort of getting back ready to play. Um, and also, you know, as a coach, obviously, it's not just a technical program. You know, also stretching them tactically, getting them thinking again. You know, not just getting them moving, but getting them thinking. You know, getting them good habits. You know, the preparation before they do things. 
you know when they do things you know uh, the specifics needed and stuff like that but we 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 made sure that each group um at least once a week had a good 30 40 minute hit technical hit um which was around passing receiving running with the ball dribbling uh, 1v1 defending um I'm trying to think if I missed anything else there so, so it was around the technical program. It was around the actions, and um, collectively as a group, we devised sessions which the groups would then fulfil, and we'd lead that. Um, and then also what we did is because the Saint Bede's program started um, at Man City at the time, which was for Year Nine up, the boys are in Saint Bede's. You know, we would we would because uh, under nine, sorry, Year Nine, Year Ten, Year Eleven we would group the players in positions and we'd put individual sessions on which was specific to their playing positions um, and um, you know that was I, that was something which I think later on I'm not saying we missed but I think the players really thrived on it I think the, the players felt um, it might even be psychologically they felt that they were developing because they were working in smaller groups and they were working with players around them in the same positions, especially if you was a younger player playing with an older player, um, someone who could be in the under 18s or on the fringes of the 21s. Um, you, it was a great experience from weekly, you know, or twice a week, whatever it was at the time. Interesting. And then, so let's just talk about you. Um, you moving across to the girls' program. Uh, how did that happen? Yeah. So, so basically, what happened was was. Um, the, the, the club applied to put a um, a team in the WSL. So the Women's Super League started. Um, and when the Women's Super League started, the, the, the guy who was the uh, director of football, Brian Marwood at the time, um, approached Mark Allen and asked for two coaches from the academy to to take on this project, working with someone who was the manager. Um, because the guy who was managing the women at the time was was never in the building around the academy stuff so had no no insight or knowledge of what the technical program was or the tactical program or the methodology because it was kind of run as a separate entity whereas we wanted it to be part of the club um so with that we um we we brought we we brought the the the, the, the girls into the academy and then when we brought them into the academy, then they they kind of fell into the program, uh, the full time program. And when they were in the program, obviously, one thing what we didn't have the finance to do was was to give every player a full time contract. You know, the first seven players we gave contracts to was was I think it was Karen Barnes, Lucy Bronze, Tony Duggan, Jill Scott, Steph Horton, uh, Izzy Christensen. Uh, I'm trying to think of else, uh, and if Keita Paris came in, um, and anyway, so we we actually only had a group of seven players who were full time at the time, and the rest were part time. So the players who were full time, we we did certain technical, physical sessions during the day with them, but then they would train later in the evening. Um, and when the season started, we kind of thought it's not working. You know, the, the program doesn't work. If it's done part time, it needs to be done full time. Then the club then backed um, Nick Cushion becoming the manager. You know, he took that role on, um, and by the way, embraced it, um, put everything into it, and you know, the team grew. Uh, the players went to full time. The numbers of players then grew to have a squad, um, and then the actual not the academy philosophy, but the club's philosophy in the way which we want the girls to play started then to um, take shape, start to flourish. Um, we started to see players who could, you know, deal and, and physically, technically, tactically, psychologically cope with what we wanted, you know, or what we were trying to aim for. And there's certain players who, 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 who were nowhere near, you know, they weren't used to that level of detail, that, you know, that level of intensity in training. Um, and, you know, there probably was a period where there were certain players who come and gone and then we kind of got a balanced squad um, and I was only working with the squad a couple of couple of days a week um, at the time. And you know, one thing what what you know I really began to learn was I didn't really know much around women's football, but it was more around how grateful and how hard working um, 
they were when they got the opportunity to work with coaches like us because they've never had it. They've never had that level of detail. They've never had that experience. They've never had, you know, people working at that level with them. You know, unfortunately, it's just never been available to them. So you kind of felt obliged to, you know, do that little bit extra. And, and you know, um, that's when the women's game grew himself, you know, and, and kind of like still to this day, you know, actively, you know, I think it's fantastic what's going on. Uh, what's, the main, what's the main differences working in women's football to the men's football? Um, I, I think, you know, um, I think when you're in academy football, you know, a lot of these boys, girls now as well, they're in the building from four and five years of age. So they're being coached from four and five years of age all the way through to, what, under 23s, you know. And, you know, they could be at a club for 17, 18 years before they even kick a ball in the first team. And, and you know, I think when you it's like anything in life, you, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. And, and you know, certain boys don't realise, you know, the level of coaching, the, you know, the, the, the fortunate to have the experience of what, 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 you know, they've had or what they're going to have. Um, and maybe just, you know, not being grateful for um, the work and where they are, the training ground, you know, because it just becomes second nature that they're there every day. You become probably a little bit complacent. You know, they might work hard on the pitch, but there's little things which, you know, I think anyone naturally does that when you're there for a period of time. But um, I think with the girls, it was because it was all new to them and it was fresh, you know, they, they, they really put the work in every day. Um, and so, so you're working, for instance, you've got, you know, it's a female pro footballer. Are, are your, you know, your, your ideals still the same when you get proficient on both feet, getting comfortable on the ball? Yeah, so, so I, it, so I, so I, pros, I, there less time to do that? No, no, definitely not. I mean, I still have pros now who come to me individually, you know, men and female and, and you know, everyone's got a skill set. Everyone's got an outstanding attribute. That's why, you know, players make a living. They're not just outstanding at everything. There's certain players who are, or are good in certain areas and outstanding in different areas. But I think what's really important is, is um, you know, with with in regards what their program is. The issue you've got with some women is because they've not been in a program when they do go in a program it's not that they're not capable it just takes a little bit of time to adjust physically especially technically with the technical actions um, and then sometimes because of obviously if they're an adult um, physically your body can only adapt so much and only develop so much so it's, it's quite hard for certain players to start to move a certain way because the movements have not been putting them when they were younger like six seven eight when you see with the lads um but the willingness to learn, the willingness to um, develop, you know, second to none, you know, and I can't doubt that, you know, you look at players in the England team now, you know, um, and one thing I don't do is claim that, oh, you know, I've done this with a player, I've done that, but one thing I will say is I know I've played a little part in some of these women's journeys to, to help them maintain, progress, or even develop to where they need to be or where they are now. Um, and, and, you know, it's been a pleasure. It's been a real pleasure. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there who, who probably don't look at women football. They go, oh, it's not for me, you know, for whatever reason, whatever their beliefs are. But what I will say is there's some fantastic talent. There's some unbelievable people who've got some fantastic journeys. You know, some of the stories which players tell you to... to um, tell you how they've got to where they are is, is unbelievable. Um and what they've had to sacrifice. Um, so, um, yeah, no, mate, it's, it's, it's been it was an eye opener at first, and, and the game's just evolving, evolving. And, and what about like working individually with a female player, interpersonal communication, motivation? Is there anything different? Was than you know in terms of the relationship? I, 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 think, I think I think I think one of the things with 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 female players is you know. Um, the, the, you know, a lot of them are very unbelievably critical of themselves, overly critical maybe sometimes. But you know, the the, the level of thought and the level of um, drive and desire is unbelievable because they've never had some of the work. You know, some of the simple things which boys are 15, 16, and they probably heard common language of you know technical actions. They've never had that. Um, they've never ever had that. 
So um, I think it's um, I think it's really important that you know when they when they are working um, that you know from a technical point of view, you know they've never they've never ever had the information given to them what boys have had at six, seven, eight drilled into them. Um, so sometimes you may say something, go, what's that? You know, and you're like, well, actually, it's, oh, is it that? Right, no one's ever called it that. Or no one's ever given me a, a term or, you know, a concept or whatever it is. So, you know, because um, someone's never been taught it doesn't mean they can't get it. Um, it's just a matter of exposing them to it. And that's one thing with, I'd say, a lot of the women players is the exposure of the level of coaching and the level of understanding. Okay, so look, just going back into your academy role then, I mean, I remember my time at Tottenham and obviously Arsenal were our bigger rivals in terms of recruitment, you know, around the corner. And then as Chelsea, uh, again, Arsenal and Chelsea were the two big players at academy football in London in terms of getting the players in. What was it like in terms of the rivalry between Man United and Man City? And obviously Man City now be- becoming a big club and uh, Man United, we talked about juggernauts, Man United historically being the you know the most productive academy in, in uh, English football. What was that rivalry like there? Uh, I think though at, at the time, um, I've got to be really careful what I say. Um, I, think, I think at the time, um, Man City invested massively uh, in regards recruitment um, and and not not recruitment as in um, being overly aggressive, but more in regards resource and probably at the time when I was there, you know, I think we had a lot more men on the ground than Man United, if that makes sense. So they would have scouts, whereas you know we would have PE teachers, we would have. Um, football managers, referees, you know, would have coaching business people who own coaching businesses. We would have um, all different types of people who were involved in the recruitment process. Whereas I think United were probably a little bit more of a tighter ship. Um, obviously, Man United's history as a club and as an academy is unbelievable. You know, no one can ever doubt on where they are. You know, if anything, they might produce more players um, into a first team than Man City. But, but you know, one thing what I will say is, you know, it's about. Um, I, I think I think we just focused on us when we were there. You know, I don't think we were overly bothered about what they were doing. It was them and us. But um, they were going after players. We were going after players. And as you know, in, in it's under six, seven, eights where you know parents, players have got choices to make. Um, we all wanted the the best potential players, and um, you'll find that. It wasn't just us. There were probably three or four or five other clubs who wanted them as well. Um, and I think we just we, we just believed in our program. You know, our program was completely different to Man United's program at the time. Um, what was the difference between United program and City's program at the time? Yeah, I, I, well, from from obviously not being in there myself, but from an outsider looking in, um, they they had some unbelievably attacking, um, confident, creative players. Um, which we had, but but we also had um, a bit of balance in between. You know, um, like you say, possession was a big part of our program um, and building up the play. You know, but but one thing what you could never take away from Man United was they just had kids with loads of desire, loads of quality on the ball going forward, um, and I'm sure the way they were coached and trained on a weekly basis was completely different to the way our boys were, um, but. Always loved to play against them, or we always loved to compete against them in recruiting. Um, and it was, it's, it's, it's like a horse race. We were ahead for a certain point, um, and then they were ahead for a certain point. Um, so, um, yeah, but no, it was it's a it was a it was a great time. And you know what I will say is, you know, Man United are a fantastic club. Man City obviously do some fantastic things. I know more of the work of what went on at Man City and the work that goes on there, but you know, um, I think both clubs give players opportunities to develop and you know have have a career in the game, mate. And and, and were you there when Guardiola was there? So yeah, yeah. So so Pep Pep come in um, probably. I was there for about sixteen months while Pep was there. Um, and so tell us a little bit about what effect he had on the academy and what, what your takeaways have been. I, I, I don't really think that, that he changed, this is my opinion, I don't really think he changed much. He, he, he definitely offered support to the coaches 
in regards to tactical work and you know uh, he was he was fantastic in regards anything to do with the kids he would let the kids come and watch training he would let us meet the meet the players he would come into training sessions and stand with the coaches he would come and stand in and you know uh, talk to the kids um, so you know which is you know you can see why he's successful he's a good person you know and, and he's he's um he's a he's a fantastic communicator and, and i think for a lot of the kids as well um there's nothing better than seeing probably one of the best football managers ever in history walk in on the pitch when you're working on the 9 10 11 12 and um you know, he, passing some of his valuable experience on. Um, so, yeah, but no, I, I, you know, he definitely had an effect on the academy and he, he obviously knew Rodolfo and, you know, there was a great link there. Um, and, you know, moving forward, mate, I'm sure that link's still going on. And so then, what's next for you? You've had this amazing career already, still a young, young man. What's, what's the next step for you? Um, so, so a big thing for me was was when 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 I finished at Man City, um, you know, um, I I had to have time out for health reasons. I had to have time out. Um, I had to assess what I wanted to do. I spent a bit of time away from football, which was probably the best thing for me, if I'm being honest, because I don't think you can actually reflect on anything until you actually do take a big step back. Um, so judging, you know, coaching sessions, judging what I was doing as a person, judging what I was doing as a coach, um, and yeah, I'll definitely be staying in the game. In what capacity, I don't know. Uh, I'm always going to be coaching. I'm always going to be helping players learn and develop. Now, in what capacity, I'm not sure. Um, and at the minute, I've just yeah, I've got a few projects what I'm involved with. Um, which are football projects, and you know. Um, you know, let's see, let's see what happens, mate. Well, do, you little, happens. do you want to give him a little, little plug here? He's got, you know, big audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I'm just working. I'm working at the minute, um, building a coaching business back in the northwest again, uh, which is working um, individually with some of the best talent at all different football clubs. Because now I don't have the allegiance to one football club. You know, I can work with players from all different clubs to offer additional support, like yourself. Um, and also doing quite a lot, you know, educational stuff and, and uh, presentations, you know, working with football clubs, um, different organisations, you know, telling them experience around different journeys of players, you know, male and female. And then also linking up with, you know, some of some of the biggest players in the game to offer different projects. And um, so, yeah, it's exciting, mate. So, so if, you know, if players up in the north there, obviously they're in the south, they've got to work with me, right? <laughs> if they're in the north, well, the north of England, well, how, how do they get in north, contact with you? Get, so if they're in the north of England, they can get me on Instagram. Yeah, so Instagram, you get on there. So it's Reese 8580 yeah. um, And as always, mate, that's that's what we need. Yeah, so if they're up north, they come to me. If they're down south, they come to that's you. It. That's what and it. eventually <laughs> they'll come together, mate. And they, eventually it. when they come together, mate, you know, There'll be some players written on that piece of paper what have been on them training pitches with us. Um, and, you know, with yourself, you know, what, what what I see with yourself and what I know about you as well, mate, is, you know, you always get the players coming back to you all the time because they trust you uh, and your experiences are invaluable. And that's one thing which, you know, I don't think the best coaches in the world are the richest because, because of the love of the game. We spend that much time on the grass and you care and you're planning and, you know, I don't ever think I'm going to be a multimillionaire from doing what I'm doing. But what I will say is, you know, the enjoyment of what I do, uh, the love of the games back, one million percent for me. And I look forward to working with some, you know, some of the next top talent, you know, in the country or abroad. Fantastic, Mark. Thanks very much, mate. Appreciate your time. Top man, Saul. Cheers, mate. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.